I work for a company called Materian, used to be called Brush Woman in the old days. Uh, I also have a special appointment with uh, Colorado School of Mines where I was a professor for, for several years. Um, and basically, and, and maybe Katie can, can learn on this, is, is once you graduate, you start making your, your career path and you decide on that. And what I decided was that I, if I consider that I'll work for 50 years active, uh, or more. Um, I decided that I wanted to do at least 20 academia, maybe 10 industry, and then go back to academia with what I learned in industry and academia. Uh, so I did academia for 14 years. Uh, now I'm in the industry. I expect to be there for, for up to 20 years, and then I'll go back to teach what I learned. I think we all have a social responsibility in in passing down the uh, torch. Uh, so I'm one of these last breed of metallurgist. Uh, my PhD is in metallurgy, just that, metallurgy. And after that, uh, I think in the 90s, uh, we got rid of the Bureau of Mines. That was a big, uh, big hit for the mining industry, extractive metallurgy. I'm an extractive metallurgist uh, by, by profession, so I do chemical processing. Now I do more of the physical processing. So one of the areas I teach is uh, extractive metallurgy of nuclear materials, and, I, and that's on my spare time, because of course I work for Materian. Uh, so I give lectures on processing thorium, uranium, beryllium, and out of all that, we also get uh, rare earth elements. It's basically the same chemistry, same one. It's just tweaking one and another, and you get the, the end result that you want. Uh, so Materian, um, as I said, started as initial, in its initial days, was Brush Beryllium, uh, the Brush Beryllium Company, founded by uh, uh, Brush, uh, Charles Brush in Cleveland. He worked alongside with uh, Edison. In fact, they worked on the filament, and, and Brush was actually one of the first people to have uh, light in, in his house. That tradition went on. He basically built his, his empire on, on the beryllium side. Uh, then in the 40s, as you know, the development of the, uh, the, the nuclear weapons program, uh, it was in, instrumental, and, and the beryllium uh, produced by Brush Beryllium back there was key for that, that success. I never met the man, Ken Walsh. He started, he was uh, in the Manhattan Project. He worked on a, uh, he started writing a book on, uh, on beryllium chemistry. Uh, he wrote the first chapter and many years after that he didn't have time and then uh, he died. His uh, widow actually approached me and Dr. Olson and asked if we can finish the book. The book now ended up having like 26 chapters. Uh, but we decided that in honor of him, we, 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 we kept his name. So it's Beryllium Chemistry and Processing. It's the only beryllium book after the 70s that's, that's uh, been out there. Uh, so with that, what I'm trying to say is, yes, if there's a thorium book, make sure it goes out there, any language, any format, everything, because that's a way to make people aware. Uh, and if you do have connections with a university, give lectures, open up, Spend the time to do it. Give lectures, teach the students not to be scared. Students are scared of using beryllium, for example, because of what they hear from people that don't know about beryllium. Once they know and they hear from the experts how to handle beryllium, how to manage it, how to use it, which is more important, then they're willing to take the risk in their companies to use that material. It's the only way. I deal now on the business side in Materian. So I did R&D in Materian. Now I'm on the business development side. So now I get to see all, all sorts of things. And the first thing I see from the engineers in a Lockheed Martin, a Raytheon, a Boeing, is fear to use beryllium. Fear. Why? Because they don't know better. Because they're told by their bosses, that's nasty. You can die. So it's a matter of teaching. And again, I think we've heard this over and over, and I'll say it again. Anyway, so now we, uh, our corporate, our company grew big, and we decided to change our name. We were not 
taken over. We, we did not merge with any other company. We simply switched names. Uh, I'm not, this is the corporate mission. We have enabled technologies. We do service. We want to be the customer's first choice. And we are environmentally responsible. A lot of our detractors, of course, they, they laugh at the last one. But we are. We are very environmentally uh, capable. We're about 3,000 employees around the world. We have 34 company facilities now. And we are in 10 countries. So we have diversified in many areas. We have different business units, advanced materials, technologies, and services. So we have thin film coatings, microelectronics now, technical materials, and what used to be that first company, Brush Woman, is now just a small division. It's uh, material and brush, and I'm part of the brush beryllium and composite side of that business. Our company is the made number 59 in the Fortune 100 fast growing company. Back in 2002, we were only 373 million sales. In 2011, we're $1.5 billion. And we've done that by diversifying our material portfolio. So we're now, we consider ourselves the second largest and most important advanced materials company in the world. And that's why our interest, obviously, in other materials. Thorium is interesting. Rare earth elements is interesting. Uh, the company itself, the, the, the beryllium side, uh, is located in Elmore, Ohio, uh, middle of nowhere. Anybody knows why it's in the middle of nowhere, Ohio? Huh? <laughs> That's true. <laughs> well, it was a preventive measure uh, to ensure that if the U.S. was ever invaded, attacked, that it was not going to be visible for Japanese or the Germans or any other power out there trying to destroy our beryllium facility. That's, that was the reason. Um, as you can see, this is how it looks like today. We recently entered, recently five years ago, we entered in, into the Title III program uh, with the Air Force and that was to build a new uh, pebbles production, a pebbles plant. That's the main extraction unit to make beryllium. Uh, beryllium is, is still, as far as I know, is still the only material, only element that is both strategic and critical to the defense uh, industry in the U.S. It's the only one. It's still there. And that's why we got support from the, uh, the U.S. government to build this plant using Title III money. So it's one of the unique cases uh, that you would see in, 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 uh, in the U.S. Uh, direct participation of the government with, with a company like ours. Still, DOE kind of hates us mm -hmm. in a certain degree. Uh, the reason is legacy. Again, we did things wrong in the past. We handled beryllium not in the appropriate way. So DOE is holding that bag of liability, holding those, those issues that were carried along. I can't mention the capacity, but we have a large capacity. We can take the demand of the U.S. and the world. There's plenty of barrel ore, birchandite ore, where we extract the beryllium from. It's all around the world. So there, the, there's plenty of sources, and we have plenty of capacity to process that. So our new plant is very state of the art. If you go in there, if you can ever go in there, you would see that it's handled like a pharmaceutical company. It's so clean, pristine. We've changed completely mentality of how we did things in the, in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. So it's totally, totally automated, by the way. So we're at two areas in material and brush. One is performance alloys. They do the low beryllium, copper beryllium. I'm pretty sure you've heard of copper beryllium. I can tell you 80% of your cell phones here use copper beryllium. 100% of your cell phones, 100% use material materials in one way or another, either in the chips, the thin films that cover them. So every single cell phone has our materials in there. The area I'm from, the beryllium side, is, is not used commercially uh, uh, out there. You don't see beryllium used in, in commercial components. 
Our markets are mostly defense and nuclear. Those are the two uh, basic ones. Uh, beryllium is, uh, again, a strategic material, so we are in anything from satellites, electro-optic systems, guidance systems, et cetera, et cetera, because of beryllium properties. In nuclear reactors, material test reactors, we are the preferential uh, reflector material. It has very unique uh, neutronic uh, uh, properties and makes it ideal as a reflector material. So flyby salts, what's flyby? Flyby is just a name, an acronym that, uh, that's been used since the molten salt reactor era uh, to define beryllium fluoride, lithium fluoride salts. Uh, and you guys know this better than me, a eight megawatt thermal molten salt reactor uh, built by Oak Ridge National Lab, uh, worked between 65 and 69. And it used mostly a 66 molar percent lithium fluoride with 34 molar percent uh, beryllium fluoride. Uh, those temperature ranges and those uh, rates. Uh, forgot to put the hours here. This is 17,000 hours of uh, working critical without any uh, major events, uh, radiation exposure, fatalities, or life threatening. So that kind of tells you it can be done safely. I mean, we did it back in the, in, in the 60s safely. We didn't have computers. We didn't have iPads. We barely had large computers that could add and do some operations. So it can be done. Imagine what we can do nowadays with the types of equipments we have. Flybe itself is not combustible. It's very stable material. It doesn't melt, but under, slightly under 455 C, that makes it ideal. You form eutectics, for those that love thermodynamics, I love thermo. Uh, so you make uh, low melting point materials. Uh, it recombines reasonably fast if it de uh, decomposes. Of course it has issues, it can attack. It's a fluoride system, so it can attack some magnesium and stainless steel, that's why we Back then, we learned Hasteloyen developed basically for this program. Uh, in fact, when I asked for a quote for Hasteloyen not long ago, the guys guy got excited. Are we again back in the molten salt reactor? And I'm like, darn, wow. I can't ask for Hasteloyen without letting people know what I'm doing. Uh, so designers can add, and, and, and there's a bunch of studies on this. Uh, one, one example is uh, the Molly. Uh, hexafluoride, which we heard about yesterday, uh, you basically passivate the surface of your stainless steel with that. Uh, and other things that we've done and we played around is adding beryllium beads to it. It kind of helps in the redox, so your uh, reduction oxidation, uh, oxidation potentials are controlled. So a lot of things have progressed since then. <coughs> Property-wise, I'm not going to go through all this. Again, <coughs> Having been a professor for so long, I, I like numbers, I like to see properties. But the big and the important <coughs> ones, thermal conductivity, this is very rare for a molten salt. If you talk to uh, uh, concentrating solar power uh, people, uh, they use molten salts. In fact, I've, I married one scientist that she works in that area, so you can imagine the solar and the nuclear guy living together. Uh, so we have a very lengthy discussions, but we, we come down to the same conclusion. If the solar industry were willing to handle beryllium, they would definitely love to use fly. I mean, to have a thermal conductivity of one and a heat capacity of 0.5, that is amazing. They would love that. They would love to have that material. But DOE does not allow them to use beryllium-containing material. So anyway, other really interesting properties that uh, you can see later on. Here's, here's my thermodynamics. I used to teach uh, advanced thermodynamics. Uh, this is a face diagram. Basically, uh, Katie, when you go to school, uh, university level, you're going to see these diagrams where you have lithium fluoride, pure lithium fluoride, pure beryllium fluoride on this side. And when you combine these two together in certain amounts, you get a liquid that can freeze at different temperatures. And you can have 
when it freezes, it has different kinds of compositions. So it's like when you mix potassium chloride, sodium chloride, and water, and you let it freeze, you're going to have may, maybe two solids that are different. They're intimately mixed, but you have two different solids. So we play with that, and we come up with this uh, diagram. It's like a map to tell us what happens if I mix this much with this much. And we've designed, or we've uh, uh, basically chemically designed a liquid with certain properties, a specific melting point. We look at things like the enthalpy of mixing. How much energy do I release when I mix these things together? How much the activity of beryllium fluoride is? And that kind of tells you what happens if I heat this up? Will the beryllium fluoride vaporize and diminish in my melt? Well, one nice thing of beryllium fluoride the activity is actually negative for, again, those who like thermodynamics. Uh, this doesn't follow the ideal mixture law. It basically, it's a Henrian type solution with a negative deviation. And we'll have a quiz about this later today. So anyway, we understand fly very well. I mean, that was probably one of the most studied salts in the 60s. Uh, that's out there, even more than sodium chloride, if you ask me. More than sodium chloride. So materium's uh, beryllium extraction process. Uh, this is a very, 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 very simplified uh, uh, schematic of it. I would have to shoot everybody in this room if I told you how we do it. Uh, a lot of people out there. We've kept this secret. Uh, they say Coca-Cola. We've kept this secret internally for more than 80 years. Uh, and, we, Matt, and we continue to do it, and we will continue to do it this way. But we can tell you the, the, the generalities of it. We basically take a barrel or a birchandite concentrate, that's the name. Barrel, do you guys know what barrel is? It's a gem, an emerald, topaz. Yeah, it's abundant. It's everywhere. You find barrel ore everywhere. I live in Colorado, by the way. I don't live in Ohio. Uh, I live up in Golden. And uh, it's the gemstone. It's the state gemstone. Barrel is everywhere. So beryllium is everywhere. It's just a matter of extracting it. So source, infinite. You're going to have source of beryllium for life. Um, so we take that. We basically add sulfuric acid, some pixie dust. We make uh, beryllium sulfate. More pixie dust, then we add an alkali in there, and what we do is we precipitate a beryllium hydroxide. That beryllium hydroxide, then we add ammonium bifluoride, and we add hydrofluoric acid, common stuff that you have under your kitchen sink, right? Um, so we process that, and we end up at the end of the day with a beryllium fluoride, which we then do magnesium uh, thermal reduction. We basically mix those two together at high temperature. F the fluorine prefers to be with the magnesium and not the beryllium, and it's a displacement reaction, and you end up with these beryllium pebbles. Those pebbles, then we basically melt them. We make ingots, and the way Materin has done it forever is we uh, actually grind the material down to a powder. And we do uh, what's called hot isostatic pressing, cold isostatic pressing, and center. So basically, it's powder metallurgy. We make blocks, shapes with the final part. Now, why do I explain all of this? Because of this. All it takes, really, to start producing fly for you guys is to modify or take an intermediate compound in our process to extract and make the fly material. All we have to do really is add some lithium fluoride or equivalent. And again, this is simplified. Uh, we have a patent application, which we'll probably keep as a secret uh, pack, patent for, for the next 20 years. Um, but the purpose is, at the end of the day, we can add uh, fly. We can make fly or even flinabi, uh, lithium fluoride, sodium fluoride, beryllium fluoride. Uh, now that I said patent, uh, and, uh, and again, we, we have worked for 80 years uh, with trade secrets. 
but we realize that espionage is real. Uh, there will be secrets that are going out there. And, uh, and the law changed too. Now it's not first to invent, it's now first to file. And we don't want to be caught in that game. Uh, that's a lot of legal fighting, as, as, you, would, as you would know. I love it. It's a great, and, it's, it's a great thing. <laughs> You can imagine how much money we're spending uh, every single day now in, 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 in attorney fees, but uh, now it's first to file. And to disprove that, then you have to fight it big time. So I decided, well, I didn't decide. My CEO decided that the process I invented, we would go ahead and patent, and then we would put the pressure to keep it as a secret patent. So, uh, so maybe in 20, 25 years, you'll, you'll be able to see how, how we actually did this. Um, what, yeah. <laughs> we will disclose what pixie dust, of course. If you're building a thorium reactor, you need to know what's, at, what's in there. You will know. Uh, but we will be watching. <laughs> uh, again, when I was doing the R&D before I went into the business world, uh, I did a lot of testing, and I did some tests on making Flybe and testing my concept and making Flanabi. So I got to play chemist for a while. I'm still alive. I didn't get sick. I used the proper procedures that work. And I, and I mentioned it earlier today. When people got sick in the past, we were at war. There's risks we take at war. We need to step up production. We need to make complicated materials like beryllium. And safety became secondary back then. We know a lot better now. We know how to handle beryllium. We all drive cars that use lead and has acid. And I don't think any of you get in the car in the morning thinking, oh my god, I have a lead battery up there and it has acid in it. Oh my God, I'm not, I, you would not drive the car. But you're trusting that the person that put it in there did his job, her job, and made it safe. That's what we do now in Brush. I didn't get sick. I got my blood tested. We do a BELPT test. I do it every three months just for the sake of it. Because I, even though I'm doing the business, I still go in the R&D lab and play around with beryllium fluoride. I like to do that. But I do it safely. I do it safely. I do with protocols. So you guys can do it too. It's just a matter, again, the teaching, teaching. We, have, we can't stop teaching our, our, our kids and the public. Excuse me, what were we looking at there? This is a block from a, a small reactor. It's about six inch diameter of uh, molten salt. That is, this one in particular is lithium fluoride, sodium fluoride, beryllium fluoride. And you're going to say, wow, that's dirty. I'm not going to use that in my reactor. Yeah, that's dirty because I'm testing it. I'm trying the different graphite, what people call nuclear graphite. Be careful. I'm not going to say who or what, but we're doing our own evaluations on, on, on nuclear grade graphite. Uh, you have to be careful when you select your materials. So that's the kind of things that we could do internally. You guys don't have to be playing with beryllium fluoride or lithium fluoride or those things. Call Materian. And we'll, we'll do it. We can set up a program with you. Um, I did a lot of characterization. I'm just showing one small shot of, uh, thermal, of electrical conductivity, for example, at different potentials. So I'm looking at the redox potential of, of uh, Flybe and Flinabi. This is, uh, believe it or not, uh, this is with discretionary funds that I had. So I set up my own system. I was told you have this, this amount of money. It wasn't much because there's not a market for FLYB. I did this on my own. I proved it. It's sitting there. I created this process. And now, now I'm encouraging you guys make this work because I told my CEO, eventually we will be using FLYB. We will be using it. So, but they're not going to put money. My company will not put money until we see something. And I agree with that. We are a private entity. We're there for the money. We love science. I love science. But we're in it for the money. Mm -hmm. 
lithium with sodium, the periodic table that are of the same color. So is that a possibility you there? You can, but the melting point. I mean, if you can live with a higher melting point, yes. Great. That's, uh, and you would like, you'd like to uh, avoid lithium yeah. because with lithium-6, with yeah. neutrons, we produce tritium. Oh, yeah. It would be nasty element. Yeah, and I have a project for that, which is not nasty. <laughs> For other applications, it's okay. See, see, uh, very, very, uh, it's almost miscible with water because it's so hygroscopic and all that. Does not make does not make it fairly. Uh, it's not it's not a bad source of fluorosis or beryllium ion that gets in the bloodstream because it's it's kind of like it, it's not uh, it's it's not really it doesn't really pass. It's kind of like eating magnesium sulfate, isn't it? In a way, if if it's only beryllium fluoride yes. alone. Yes, it absorbs. In fact, I would take chunks of beryllium fluoride, I would put them on a, uh, the table, and it would melt, and it would look gooey. And what it's doing, it's taking that moisture, making beryllium hydroxide plus hydrofluoric acid. But if you do it in an enclosed environment, neutral, uh, uh, controlled atmosphere, and you add the lithium fluoride or the other salt, then you've stabilized that. Right, and, and the, the, the equal molar sodium fluoride beryllium uh, dichloride forms a detected equal molar ratio that's a little that's lower melting than five, and we don't have to worry about uh, lily pure lithium seven for the first generation. Exactly. Yeah. And I think I'm running out of time right now. You're getting close. All right. So again, I mean, we we made the uh, fly material, and mostly beryllium fluoride. I think I don't know the whole history behind it, but I think. People in Oak Ridge wanted to do their own mixtures, they wanted to play around, so, but at least we provided the beryllium fluoride back then. Uh, we've developed now a new process that lowers the cost, it's a lot cheaper, and uh, we don't use the beryllium fluoride itself, we use a different part of it. Um, and we are definitely there to provide support on studies on the salt, making the salt, adjusting chemistries, etc. I will say though, and this is me talking as a professor, uh, I would love to do it for free. I would love to do it for a little bit of money, but that's not gonna happen. My, in corporate world, my boss and my boss's boss, they want to make money out of this, and they will only invest if they see money coming out of it, period. So we're willing to help. If you can help find the funding, we're willing to put in money to compensate part of that funding. But we would have to do a collaborative uh, effort for, for that. And again, if you have questions, questions about beryllium in general, uh, your concerns about safety, health, et cetera, uh, please ask. Send emails. Don't assume. I mean, we, again, and I go for the lead thing, we, we, we're not biting a lead battery. You guys are not biting on your cell phones and, and eating the gallium arsenide you have in your phones because it has gallium arsenide. But we need those materials, okay? We just need to know how to handle them, all right? Hi, Bob Hargraves. <clears throat> Oak Ridge had a 1.4 meter beryllium sphere in the lobby of one of its buildings. It was the vessel for the fireball reactor. It was on display, but somehow disappeared. Did you build it? Do you have a photograph of it we could use sometime? I, I know we did build it, but I don't have a photograph of it. Good. I, can, I can probably get some pictures of spheres that look like basketball sized spheres that we built. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and we have the smaller ones as well. Question yeah. here? Yeah. I would like to know if you reprocess uh, beryllium that uh, have been burned by uh, neutron. <laughs> that's a very good question. Obviously, when you have a reflector that's been exposed to neutron irradiation, you generate a lot of beryllium-10 and all the transuranic. Uh, our facility is not uh, set up or does not have the licenses to uh, reprocess irradiated materials. Uh, we have been in discussions with uh, the Japanese Atomic Agency, uh, which are interested in doing that. Uh, we went to DOE, and that pretty much did it. No interest. Please don't bury the old reflectors underground. Don't put them in casket. Don't move them. 
what are we supposed to do then? We're offering now to reprocess and you still say no. And you want a nuclear industry? About probably about four or five years ago, I called Brush Wellman. I'm, I was trying to remember by your voice if it was actually you, but okay. whoever I talked to was excited because they were talking to some of the Oak Ridge and brought to my attention that Brilliant Fluoride is going to be a lot cheaper than Brilliant because that last step, maybe I'm going to get a shot for some of this information here, but that last step is the most expensive step going Brilliant Fluoride to Brilliant. He, he couldn't really give a price at the time. Is there anything, can you say a quarter of the cost of Brilliant Metal? Uh, a tenth, uh, anything at all? Do you have a product line? Do you I sell need, Brilliant Fluoride? You know, I knew you were going to ask that question. <laughs> okay. And I did my plot, assuming linear or exponential. I'm not going to show it there, but I can, okay. can kind of guess 20, between 20 and 30% cheaper than Beryllium. Oh, cheaper than? Not cheaper than, off. no. Oh. Oh, you're, you're but <laughs> that's current technology. <laughs> He's Beryllium fluoride, with the other process, we might take it to a 30% of the total price. Okay. Yeah. And to add on, to steal an extra, I'm mm -hmm. dealing with a professor at University of California who's scared to deal with it mm -hmm. and wants to deal with sodium fluoride, zirconium fluoride, because of that. Yeah. Where do I send him to, to get assurance? To you? To send him to me. Send okay. him to me. And, and, and I'm in a weird position in the company now. I do the business side, but I get called into the R&D department at least once a month. So I spend one week doing R&D work, specifically in this area. And I handle those kind of, kind of issues. Yeah, that would be good. Just, just to go back to what you said about solar and how the solar industry would love some fly. Um, is anybody doing this overseas where the regulations might not be as strict? <laughs> uh, We've heard rumors that China is trying to do something like this. Uh, Europe definitely does not want to see beryllium on their soil um, at all for anything. In fact, we're starting it again to fight with uh, a, a German a group that uh, we, we were the only guys, or beryllium was the only element that made it into the Rojas and the Reach list of banned materials. And it was the only one that was actually ever taken out of the list because of no reason to put it in there in the first place. Uh, but now the Germans came up with pictures, I'm, I'm being serious, pictures from the 50s and 40s showing people dying and people exposed to beryllium. And that was enough to now trigger again an investigation in trying to ban beryllium. And again, it's all about handling. Solar, we did do studies. Sandia uh, National Lab did studies uh, modeling where they would use fly material as a solar salt to collect the energy. It worked beautifully, but it's beryllium. So nitrates, even though their heat capacity is crappy, it's, it's a preference right now. And my wife, she's, she's working in that field. And, and I, and I encourage her to find the right salt, but I say, geez, just use fly. <laughs> well, I want to thank you very much. We sort of have to keep the ball rolling. Thank you so much for doing that. No doubt.